Hello everyone, this is part 4 of my interview with Doc, who is a Navy Corpsman, which is a medic in the US Navy that is attached to US Marine Corps units. And in this episode we'll talk about the characteristics that make a great Navy Corpsman and also what's the difference between serving on a carrier and a base. When you look back on your colleagues you've met throughout your impressive career, is there some human characteristic that have made them great in their job? I think that there's a couple of characteristics that make for a good corpsman. There, there has to be, and it's kind of like a recipe uh, for baking. Um, some people bake and they used measured amounts. Some people bake and they saw the measured amounts, but now they kind of do it just, you know, instead of a tablespoon, they do a couple sprinkles or whatever. I, I think that's true of characteristics as well. So there has to be some narcissism in there because uh, when I was treating someone, there was no question as to what I need to do uh, and the order in which I needed to do it. The priorities that I made for myself on that patient were from God himself in my mind because I... I there was no question and no one would be able to, to change my mind about it. So I think there has to be some narcissism. I think there has to be some <clears throat> caring and intelligence because you have to be able to understand the training and why, how the human body works and why, why the process that you need to, or intervention that you need to put in works. I think you need to care about that person at the same time you have to be removed uh, emotionally removed from side feelings while you're taking care of that person. And then you, you have to have a sense of adventure because there's some narcissists that maybe care about people and think they're intelligent, but they're, they're definitely not going to go into harm's way. You know, they're one part of that recipe overwhelms the other their narcissism is too strong i'm too important to the human race to risk myself whatever so you have to have that that sense of adventure and finally i think the best people that are not only good at doing it but also processing the information afterwards so that uh, you take the best qualities and you leave all the bad things behind I think that all the people that I've met that impress me had had a little bit of all of those things. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I personally, uh, this reminds me of what I read in, I think, in the Business Insider video or something about uh, leadership. And and they said they, they need, um, leaders need to be, have a, a strong confidence, but at the same time should be open for feedback and I I think this is the very important part. When they make this, this decision, they have to be confident that everyone follows them. And I think this is what you mean with a bit of na narcissism, I guess. Because in that moment, I guess you, you know exactly, you're 100% sure that you're doing the right thing. But I assume afterwards you would be open for feedback or if you learned something new, then you would apply it in, in the future. Yes, it, it, exactly. Doctors that I have had a lot of respect for, if they'd been on the battlefield and told me to do something different, I would have been, I would have calmly explained to them that they were putting themselves in harm's way by being near my patient. <laughs> but if afterwards they came to me and said, hey, I think if you did this first and that second, and here's why I think that, because and they explained it to me, then I'd be very receptive to that and probably would carry that on with other patients. So I, I see what you're saying, that yes, and maybe instead of narcissism, it's a, a, a strong confidence. Don't question me in the moment, but please give me feedback afterwards, and maybe that will change tomorrow's moment or you know, follow-on moments. Yeah, I think it's, it's a professional attitude to focus on effectiveness and not optimization and to do it in the right order optimization is afterwards in the moment it's most important to do the effective thing exactly i want to add that sometimes those impressive people to me are the most difficult to get along with because it, it seems that sometimes for them to have 
the correct recipe to be really good at what they do. They have, have I don't want to say lack something else, but maybe it was never important to them to to get socialization. So sometimes it's very hard to put up with them outside of that arena that they are so good at. Since you also served on a super carrier, how different is serving on a carrier when compared to serving in a regular camp or base? Well, um, so serving on a man of war, be it a carrier or anything like that, the injuries that you're going to see, like I said earlier, are going to be musculoskeletal in nature, um, joints, uh, lower back, um, basic illness, uh, colds, stomach viruses, flus, issues you have to remember when you deal with uh, trauma, which is always going to be some type of uh, ripping or tearing of the skin, or the bacteria that are on board warships. Uh, MRSA is very prevalent, uh, so you have to be very careful with how you treat them later. But uh, they're very standard, and um, they become very routine. Uh, when you're on board them. On bases, uh, the only bases I was uh, at, uh, being a corpsman, you get put into a hospital or a clinic. Uh, now, when you're with Marines, when you're with Marines uh, in CONUS or on bases, again, the, the thing you worry about is their boredom and what new and inventive way they're going to find to hurt themselves or others, uh, but not intentionally, always unintentionally. And the injuries are the same, uh, musculoskeletal uh, ripping and tearing of the skin, contusions, things like that. And how about the, the general living conditions? Or I mean, for me, I, I, I've, I've been on a few small ships, but how is it to be on a, on a carrier um, around the, the whole conditions or what you experienced? Well, on board a, a ship, a man of war or... A supply ship. Well, not supply ships. I have been on those and they have state rooms. But on board a man of war, you're going to be in a birthing compartment. And depending on the size of the ship is uh, also translates to the size of the birthing compartment. On board the Carl Vinson, I think my birthing compartment had 150 people in it. Uh, the space that you're given to live in, sleep in, is about six and a half feet long by not quite 36 inches, I think it's 34 or 35 inches, and your rack, your bed is a coffin locker, which is uh, you pick it up and you have about six inches of room underneath the bed uh, for all of your stuff. Uh, same dimensions as far as the uh, six and a half feet by 34, 35 inches wide. Uh, so you don't carry a lot of stuff on board ship with you. Uh, you're very particular with what you take with you, and uh, your work environment can uh, supplement that. So I was a lab tech on board my last ship, and um, on the Carl Vinson, I was just a general duty corpsman. With a general duty corpsman, I had no desk. I had no, my workspace was wherever my LPO told me my workspace was for that day. Uh, on board my last ship as a, a lab tech, I also had refrigerators, so I was always able to have soda with me. So when I go on board deployments, I would bring soda and I'd put them in the storeroom and I'd usually have one or two in the refrigerator and the docs knew about this and they would usually come by, which meant instead of putting four in the refrigerator, I'd put six because I knew so-and-so was going to come by and want one. Uh, I had deep freezers for frozen blood. I'd also get popsicles and throw in there on top of that. Uh, frozen blood is individually packaged in wooden box, uh, wooden in uh, cardboard boxes. So I get these long popsicles and throw into a negative 70 freezer and uh, didn't take long to freeze them at all. So I always had popsicles. So the type of deployment you have on board ship is dependent upon the job that you do and uh, your rank and um, the space that you have to supplement what you have to bring on board. So you, your benefits go with, with your, to a certain degree of your rank or importance on the ship kind of makes sense also. 
Yes, and also whenever the ward wasn't being utilized because the mattress on board uh, ship, your birthing rack, the mattress is maybe two inches thick on top of a solid sheet of uh, metal. Uh, so it's very uncomfortable to sleep on. Uh, in the ward, they had uh, six inch mattresses that are on top of springs uh, instead of a sheet of metal. So they're much more comfortable. And then if ICU isn't being used on board the carrier, that's maybe two to four beds on board um, an LHD or a helicopter assault ship, there it's usually like 18 or 20. Uh, then the beds are just like hospital beds, in which case you can lift the head and lift the feet a little bit. And uh, they have an air cushion in them to to keep from uh, patients getting decubitus ulcers from sitting in or laying in the same position all the time. So, you know, it, you can have very comfortable nights of sleep and you can have very uncomfortable nights of sleep. With the Marines on base, I always had a room, um, sometimes with a roommate, very rarely uh, with a roommate. Out in the field, I typically don't even have a sleeping bag or if I have a a Humvee, I sleep in the Humvee, or uh, I dig a hole in the ground, depending on, you know, the, the circumstances, and, you know, I curl into a fetal position in a hole in the ground and hope nobody ever sees me. So, um, you know, it, it, your living conditions are dictated by your environment and the mission that uh, that, that unit has to complete. 